One, two, one, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. One, two, testing, one, two, one, two, testing, one, two, one, two, one, two. Testing, one, two, one, two, one, two. One, two, one, two, one, two. Testing, testing, one, two, one, two.
here to NLA. I'm Peter Murray, uh, Chairman of NLA, and uh, we'll be moderating proceedings this morning. And uh, we're going to be discussing uh, tall buildings in London. And uh, the question is, how, how many is too many? And I'd like to thank our program champions, Jill Ahern and Mace, and the program supporters, Simpson Hall, for uh, helping us uh, put this on. Uh, and as uh, I'm sure most of you have read, we launched our fifth NLA tall building survey uh, last week, uh, and uh, we uh, showed that there were some 500 towers in the pipeline uh, for London, and by towers, uh, we talked about buildings over 20 stories high. Um, it, Descriptions of tallness uh, vary from boroughs and uh, within the GLA, but basically we took uh, 20 stories because that's a sort of recognisable height for people of a uh, lot of local authority housing of the, of the 60s, so people can uh, visualise what 20 stories is. And uh, so the data showed that uh, 2017 was a year where tall building applications and developments remained strong across the capital. The exact total was 510. Um, and that was up from 455 in 2016, and uh, we now currently have a record 115 schemes under construction. And uh, the research shows that uh, tall buildings are, I think, increasingly uh, becoming a, a key part of the uh, solution to delivering housing in the capital, and uh, there's around 100,000 homes uh, within that pipeline, which goes towards delivering the uh, 66,000 homes a year that the uh, mayor uh, needs to deliver. But uh, as we all know, the, the debate on what role tall buildings should play in supporting London's growth still poses uh, lots of questions, uh, questions of affordability, quality design, livability, impacts on skyline, and uh, long-term maintenance. So uh, uh, we're here to discuss at least some of uh, th those points. So uh, the first uh, spate of tall residential buildings, which came out of areas like Nine Elms, uh, were seen to be uh, described by, I think, Peter Rees as uh, uh, sort of, uh, saving boxes in the sky. Uh, but we're seeing uh, a, a whole new trend at the moment of uh, more affordable homes being built uh, in outer London. So uh, you know, what are the changing situations we're looking at today in terms of what those homes do for uh, the required numbers and uh, to deliver houses for Londoners. So um, we've got uh, four speakers who are going to uh, present, I think, rather different views about uh, uh, tall buildings. And uh, when they've uh, made their presentation, we will then have a uh, discussion and uh, give you a chance to ask some questions of our panellists. So to... Um, start off with, uh, we have Nicholas Boyce-Smith. Um, he's founding director of the very influential Create Streets, and from the title of his organisation, you can imagine what he thinks about tall buildings. So, Nick, over to you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, actually, we're not completely opposed to tall buildings. This lecture's two hours, is that right? That's, that's fine, the one, fine, yes. Fine, fine, fine. Um, uh, brilliant. So, um, uh, if if uh, you lose the will to live in the next 90 seconds based on how I look and how I sound, uh, this is what I'm going to say. So listen, read, and you don't need to listen to the rest. So look, tall buildings absolutely do have their place, particularly in a big international city. Some people love them. Uh, they can work very well in high-connected areas if you can afford the running costs. Um, but we don't need them at an absolute level to deliver sufficient homes. Most of the best, most successful cities do their density differently. And the case I'm going to make is actually, it's not really an anti-towers case, it's more of a positive case for a different type of urban form that is better at delivering, delivering social inclusion and actually long-term value and happy citizens who know more of their neighbours and, and get on better with them. Um, I'll make that case, if you like, uh, pictorially, but above all, I'll try and make it rationally and empirically. Because the fascinating and exciting thing, as many of you will know very well, um, is that the, the explosion in GIS and other data allows us to, to talk with more and more confidence about how cities work. So I'll make the case that uh, a, a medium rise, gentle density is better aligned with well-being for residents, lower energy usage for a given density, it's more popular, can get to exponentially support more support for homes, and actually to greater unit values, particularly in the long term. And, and then if we get time, probably won't, so pay attention to this bit. Uh, we've had a London plan and, and, and housing guidance that has been 
actually unintentionally, chronically biased against gentle density, against a fine-grained urbanism. That's why we've ended up in this morass where we're doing, we only build towers where land values are ridiculously high, where subsidy or planning requires it, or where you're dealing with big, big swinging egos. And, and that's the situation we've got ourselves into today. So that's it. That's all I'm going to say. You can, you can stop now if you want. Um, <laughs> here are the two densest kilometres, square kilometres in Europe, Barcelona and Paris. No towers in sight. You don't need to do this. Um, oh, um, uh, so this is the case I'm making for, for high-density, beautiful, walkable areas. And the data that underpins that, we're going to look at it just quick. Connectivity, density, greenery, homes, facades, beauty, nature of space, height, land use, urban blocks. These are the things where we can actually be increasingly confident. And the reason, uh, perhaps at an emotional level, why we can see, so everyone realises this is a truth, because developers delivering something different use the language of traditional urbanism. They just don't mean it. Um, so calling it a gardens, even though it's in the south of London, President Trump, doesn't make it a garden. This, this is a garden. Um, calling it a square, I have no problem with, uh, with uh, Malaysian investment, but calling it a square doesn't make it a square. And calling it, calling it a village doesn't make it a village. Um, uh, uh, the, the nice architects of this describe it on their website as human scale. Um, well, I've never met the sort of Brobdignaggy and hum scaled humans you'd need to meet to, to, to be at the same scale as that. Uh, this isn't a London Square, though it is so bad. So that's a London Square, and this is my new favourite. This is not Canaletto. <laughs> that is Canaletto. <laughs> there is a reason that words are misused, and it is because the developers are trying to, to uh, give, them, give a value uh, to, to their developments that uh, humans don't find. This is a very influential man. Peter was kind enough to call us influential. I'm not nearly as influential as this man. If you haven't heard of him, you should. He's the director of what used to be called... Do you, do you remember a man called David Cameron? Have you heard of him? He, he used to be prime minister, and he set up something called the Nudge Unit, technically called the Cabinet Office Behavioural Insight Unit. And this man who runs it... I'm not reading this to you, because I'm assuming you can all read, so you're reading it for me. Um, but uh, he actually wanted to be an architect. I'm going to come back to him later. Um, and, and he's passionate about using data to look at where people are happy, where they know their neighbours, and what types of community work. Um, I'm going to I'm going to scamper through this too quickly, so uh, I apologise. Greenery is a good thing, um, but not all the time. If you don't use it, or if it is physically threatening because it is dark and not lit, let's look at the data on towers. Well, we've looked, we've managed to find, I think it's 85, yeah, 85 peer-reviewed studies in academic journals that analyse in a controlled way some element of human well-being and the building in which you live, and the scale of the building, either the height or the, or the sheer massing of the building. Um, so these are all in academic studies. I think you know, some are better than others, frankly. Um, the, the best available academic review, which was done in 2005 by Professor Robert Gibbert in Canada, he concluded, literature suggests high-rises are less satisfactory than other housing forms for most people, not optimal for children, social relations are more impersonal, helping behaviours are less than in other housing forms, crime and fear of crime are greater. That's less frequently true these days, and, they may independently, and that may independently account for some suicides. But of the, of the 85 studies we've found looking at these types of issue, um, trying to look at comparable uh, community groups... Um, we find that just under 80% do associate, I'm not saying cause, but I am saying associate, uh, lower levels of well-being with living in, you know, in, in small units in very big buildings, or at any rate, in units in very big buildings. Um, the most recent, not, not anymore, but when I wrote this slide, the most recent research was some Vancouver research, which actually isn't perfectly controlled, so it's not in that list. Nevertheless, it's telling, because Vancouver is rightly often cited uh, as an example of good tower creation in the, in the last 20 years. Uh, except the people living in the towers are less likely to know their neighbours, less likely to have done them a favour, and less likely to trust them, uh, and less likely to believe their wallet would be returned if they left it lying around. Not quite controlled data, so I imperfect. But we are seeing, and I think the next slide, the, the, the um, charts have jumped off this slide I discovered about five minutes ago. Um, there are th this, historically, there are three themes that seem to underpin much of this. This is the least true now, I think, or the, the least frequently true. Uh, the, the, there's only one, of all the studies, there's only one that finds children doing better in high-rise uh, than, in, than in lower buildings, and that's one where the alternative is very, by very traffic road. Uh, this is a, one of the early pieces of studies done on the Crudders Parks estate. Uh, mothers uh, with children above the sixth floor, I think this is from memory, I think 62, 63% of them were reporting behavioural difficulties. The same socioeconomic group in houses, 3%. Of those below six stories, about 53%. The ease of children going out into uh, an open space and being con you know, observed by the parents, uh, just much greater. Inhuman scale seems to discourage uh, treating your neighbours uh, well and trusting them. 
you can design your way out of that, and no doubt Jonathan will talk about that very convincingly. You can do it, but you can only do it by taking out some of the efficiencies of scale and of cost management that are half the point in the first place. There's one lovely US study uh, done with students. Students are a good group to do experiments on because you get a natural control, and they left wallets lying around, they requested charitable donations, and they, what are the other things, and they um, left stamped addressed envelopes lying around. And the higher the students were in the building, or the bigger the building they were in, the less likely they were to post the envelope, to return the wallet, or to make the charitable donation. We just don't feel as connected. We, can, we know that in the discussion, we can go into more detail on why. And I'm, crime you can design your way out of. All the early tower blocks have major crime issues. That's not the issue if you've got high value uh, tower blocks, which is the type we're building now for the most part. And you can manage your way around that with concierge and with, with expensive costs. But the point, this is the point. It's an inefficient way of providing high-density housing. You can get many of the same efficiencies without the need of concierge and expensive management in, in, in a traditional urban framework. Um, in this climate, you're creating major issues of, um, uh, of, uh, of overshadowing and less livability, less so further south. Uh, uh, there's been a host of research showing that people on the ground, you know, on the ground floors or near the ground floors interact more with their neighbours or with people walking past. Um, I'm going to jump on a little bit. Uh, wind effects. You, again, you can manage your way around that, but on the whole areas which are next to very high buildings, particularly when they're sheer facades, unless you get into very expensive management, you know, tend to be more windy and, and, and less livable. So there's an impact on the city as, as well as on the residents. Um, uh, Professor Colin Ellard in, uh, uh, in Canada has been doing recent... Uh, 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 virtual reality experiments where he measures people's stress as they walk around different types of urban environment. Uh, areas obviously with high traffic but also with high buildings and with sheer facades are provably correlated with higher levels of stress. Areas like this with much lower levels of stress. I think we should be building density and human scale and beauty where people don't go around stressed and, and overpowered by their environments. And if we build that in a conventional block structure like here, this is some work we were doing, um, uh, you get lower crime and you get slower traffic because you're getting the, uh, the, 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 the tight turn. So there's a different way of providing density. I'll jump over that. Um, uh, and what the building looks like really, really matters. It isn't just that the urbanist is right, but you're, you know, for those of you who are architects, I'm imagining a couple in the room, what you do is incredibly important. Here's a beautiful study done by a man, some of you will know, I'm sure Peter does, Charles Montgomery, uh, Happy City. Uh, volunteers posed as lost... Uh, uh, students pretended to be lost tourists in front of these two buildings. Students are good people to do experiments with because they're cheap. Um, these are in the same parts of, I think, from, uh, I forget if it's Vancouver or Seattle. 10% um, of passers-by offered to help the, the lost tourists in front of this building, uh, and 2%, just over 2%, in, in front of that building. Uh, and similar multiples offered to lend them their mobile phone or to take them to the nearest uh, the metro stop. Um, here's uh, some, this is, rather, this is not about towns per se, but it is about the importance <coughs> of the city form. Um, buildings that are more, this, this is an eye tracking technology. Have, you, have any of you come across eye scan? We're about to do some work on this in London. Um, it measures what you look at for the first 30 seconds that you look at an image. And this is done, I forget on how many hundred people looking. But the, the more elevated a facade is, uh, the more there is for you to look at. So the red dots are what you look at the most, then the yellow, then the blue down to nothing. And when you have a blank facade, there's nothing to look at. Your brain doesn't engage with it. And this is why when you get out, and I'm not going to talk about the design disconnect today, but once you get outside uh, the professional bubble of people who are interested in a new building because it's new, human beings outside that respond very differently to buildings that have a more articulated facade. Here's another example. This is what people actually look at. When you've got a blank facade, you just don't look at it. Um, I'm going to jump over that one. This is a, the first piece of research done some years ago now on... Um, uh, beauty in the environment. Uh, people were asked to report where they felt good, where they felt not good. Uh, again, done on students. And 62, 63% of how people responded to the built form was a function of where they were, not, not who they were. Um, and then this really, again, links through to, um, uh, to, to mental well-being. Um, uh, there have been a range of studies in the US. I'll cite just one from the UK. Uh, some work done by an impressive lady at the University of Warwick um, found that the areas where people uploaded the most photos and felt that the photos were best commenting on were well correlated with areas of, of lower mental stress and higher mental well-being. Um, we can get to, you know, to, to density without needing towers. And just to come back to towers for a couple of minutes before I end, um, towers are cost more to run. And as they age, they cost provably more to run. We often have the Barbican cited to us to, to say that everything we're saying is rubbish. Uh, the problem is that a two-bedroom flat in the Barbican has an 8,000 pound... Some people live in the Barbican, has an 8,000... In the Shakespeare Tower, at any rate, has an 8,000 pound service charge. That's not rent, that's service charge. That's very nice if you can afford it, not so nice if you can't. Um, 
I'm going to jump over that, environmental sustainability. Now, we're actually about to kick off some work on this shortly. This is some interesting work done by uh, Professor Philip Stedman at UCL looked, looked on, looking at London towers. Um, higher buildings are less energy efficient per square meter in energy usage than lower buildings. Come, we can go back to the discussion as to why that is, and we get the, the, same, the same finding in Hong Kong. Um, that means that although there are obviously provable advantages of higher density in terms of energy sustainability and transport use, you can, get to the, uh, you can double up on that effect by having a built form that gets to you the density without having... You're waving at me to stop. No, well, I'm afraid I'm here. You have to come physically stop me. Um, no, I will stop in a moment. Uh, an, another important point is it's a way of getting more support for housing. So there's been a, lots of... We've perhaps published a book looking partly at why people are NIMBYs. Um, there's been a range of studies, about 50%, it's, it's one of the top two factors as to why people oppose new housing, it tends to be they just don't look like what it looks like. Um, we found several, we've done several studies and done visual preference surveys ourselves, uh, where um, how high it is then becomes a function. You can get about up 70, 80, 85% support in London, up to about six, seven stories, and then it just collapses. So it's not the way to get public support for housing. This is a survey we did, a visual preference survey for a community group we're working with, uh, in Peckham, literally a, a few weeks ago. We asked them to grade how much they wanted to see buildings on a scale of zero to five. Zero is no, five is yes. Look at the support for highly articulated medium rise density. It's very, very clear. Same survey, the support for um, a, a different type of facade and a different type of urban, urban form. So by, by going for the uh, very high density point block approach, even when inserted into a streetscape, we're not making it easy to get public support for delivery. Um, I'm going to jump over that tomorrow survey. Um, and then people say they, they actually prefer the medium rise approach to, to building London. This is a survey that Maury did. Uh, I'm going to jump over that. And I'm just going to say two more things on value, then I'll be shush because, yes, I have gone on too long. So this, we, we looked in a, in a book we published last year at every single property sale in six British cities, London, Leeds, Newcastle, uh, Birmingham, Manchester, and Liverpool. And then we correlated uh, every single element of urban form that we could get enough data for you know, with, the, with the prices. So we looked at, well, what, you know, what, what is it about cities? Step away from the property value of a unit. What is it about bits of city that people prove, you know, provably prefer in the pricing? And it correlates remarkably well with the polling and with all our experience in the visual preference surveys and engagement that we run with residents in London and now increasingly beyond. Um, so just to take the London data, because this is new London architecture, um, based on every single property sale in 2016, every single one, if you have a property which is otherwise identical in an area with an above average number of pre-1900 properties, it comes with a value premium of just below £60,000. If you take an area which is a, a property which is close to listed building, it's just under £50,000. A high intersection density, which is a measure of a traditional street pattern, £57,000. The new build, I'm afraid there isn't evidence on towers per se in this, uh, the new build premium is, is, is £8,700. The, the types of area, the types of place that people say they prefer that are correlated with higher values, which are better at delivering social, affordable, and market housing in the same urban form without segregating rich people in their towers looking down on the plebs below, are the types of things that actually make for the best long-term investment. And you get the same correlation on index of multiple deprivation. In every single city we looked at, areas of high density and high open space, the towers in the, in, in the park uh, format, were provably correlated, strongly correlated, with high index of multiple deprivation. The data is telling us something, the people are telling us something, and the numbers are telling us that towers are not the way, they have their place, some people love them, but they are not the way to provide fair, valuable, equitable housing for the majority of the people, the majority of the time. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> you all right? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nick. And uh, now our next speaker is uh, Jonathan Drage. He's an associate at Metropolitan Workshop. And uh, I recently visited a very nice tower that they built in one of those relevant areas that move Nick was the, talking you know, about. I'm just going to move on the slides for him. Oh, that's very kind of you. Uh, yes, a, a, a nice pocket home in the middle of Wandsworth, just the sort of place where you think they're appropriate, Nick. So, uh, Jonathan, over to you. Uh, did you have the... He's here. Uh, sorry, ah, sorry. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here today to talk to you about my recent projects. Uh, I'm uh, lucky to be working on and designing and building two schemes for you know, much, uh, much, needed, much needed housing for low-income Londoners. 
I'd like to tell you about this today. So, um, there's obviously a lot of uh, taller buildings in the pipeline, particularly Greenwich and Tower Hamlets. I think, you know, I'm personally for um, tall buildings in the right places if they meet the right criteria, and we have to be very, very careful. Uh, I love uh, squares and streets as much as the next person, but I think sometimes there is, an, is a requirement and there is an um, imperative to go higher, and I'm not, you know, not afraid to do it. So, I think there's a prejudice. I think 60-40, um, I'm right to say, roughly 60-40 in the industry, maybe slightly higher against uh, throughout the um, general public. So what are, what are the criteria? So I'm going to argue today that if we judge tall buildings against affordability, the quality of the private and public community spaces, and lastly, the most important thing, design quality, these have to be well-designed buildings. If we're going to go high, they've got to be good. So first up, affordability. Um, I'm working for Pocket Living, two schemes. Pocket Living, um, uh, I think, leading the field in delivering uh, low-cost, affordable homes for Londoners. Eligibility criteria. So on the left-hand side, you'll see a um, scheme in Croydon, which is just broken ground. Very, very excited. This is 21 floors. 73% of, of these homes for Londoners are affordable. Uh, that is quite, quite staggering. I, I think it's great. So we've got 153 homes, 112 of these are for um, eligible uh, Londoners, city makers, you know, nurses, firemen, you know, anyone that qualifies, and they're selling like hotcakes. Uh, there's so much demand. On the right-hand side, this is just finishing on site, it's due to finish in four weeks. This is um, Mapleton Crescent in Wandsworth, just south of Southside Shopping Centre, if anybody knows um, Wandsworth at all, Wandsworth Town Centre. Uh, broadly similar in terms of materiality, um, a bluey grey glazed tile with GRC on Addiscombe and a lovely, lovely, lovely uh, bespoke uh, green terracotta tile on Mapleton more later. So it's a triangular site, you get a triangular building. Um, there is a core to the north, uh, beautiful natural daylight is emitted from three sides. You've got an east wing facing the river. You've got a south wing um, facing south. Beautiful, slender form, I believe. Uh, some may, you know, may not agree with that. And I think the pocket product, the one-bed, one-person home, is a game-changer. I really do believe this. Uh, you've got a living space, uh, a bedroom, full-height windows, lovely floor, you know, lovely kitchen, lovely bathroom, very compact, very well-designed. You know, this is really, really a game-changer. I think it's revolutionary. Uh, so pocket homes, uh, in case you don't know, they're sold with a 25% market discount. This is in perpetuity, so if you sell the flat, you have to get a surveyor, they assess a fair price, and it's sold with that discount. The second criteria that I'm going to judge tall buildings against is the, obviously the, qu the quality, the variety uh, of private and public spaces. Um, how does it contribute towards the landscape, the public realm, and what kind of spaces are we providing within the building and on top of the building uh, if we're going to go high? So this is the context of Wandsworth, um, Mapleton Crescent. You've got a cluster of buildings, a shopping centre. We had to go high because there is a shopping centre, um, so about six or seven storeys. Um, this is a view from the south, two wings. This is the uh, view from the um, street. You've got an upper floor residence lounge, beautiful um, residence lobby at ground floor. You've got a, um, a level 23 terrace, which I can show you. That's the lobby. Sorry, that was very quick. See that again. Uh, that's the lobby. That's the roof terrace. And I'm extremely, extremely proud to be providing this view for um, you know, eligible Londoners. Um, this is our scheme in Croydon. This is Addison Grove again. So there is a Richard Surfit building. It's known locally as the um, 50p building. I'm sure many of you know it. Um, we first looked at an extant permission uh, of 70 homes, roughly 12 to 10 stories. We thought you know, 15 to 11. 
may be appropriate. And we actually realized that the higher you went and the greater the difference between the two you know, masses, the more slender the form at the front um, allowed us to not only create a beautiful response, we believe, but also allowed us to push the building line back and contribute towards the public realm. So that's a view from East Croydon Station, uh, a lovely stack of um, balconies on the corner that project slightly, uh, long corridor, um, views and light in from both ends. That's the uh, entrance. Um, that is the residence lobby. So pocket, when everyone moves into a building, they get uh, people together beforehand. So there's already a sense of community. Um, there, you know, I really enjoy working for them. This is Addison Grove, ninth floor. Um, there's a community garden. Um, this is the tower elements. Lots of kind of raking, you know, piers that dance around. Uh, this is Addison Grove, the level 20. Um, we call it the Nordic Garden. There's a private garden further higher, you know, further up the building. Sorry, which is enclosed. Um, read a book. So the last thing, very quickly, because I'm obviously gone over time. Design quality. Uh, this is Mapleton Crescent. You can look at Mapleton Crescent in the sun or on a dark, you know, rainy day like today, and it will look completely different. Um, we use three different types of terracotta, um, three different profiles, rather. Uh, it can look green, blue. It's wonderful. It changes. And it, you know, we believe makes a, a significant contribution to the skyline, uh, a positive contribution to the skyline in Wandsworth. Some of the terracotta. Uh, thank you very much. So, yeah, three criteria. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, our next speaker is Ian Simpson, who's a founding partner of Simpsonhoff, who have uh, uh, designed uh, uh, tyres in Manchester and, uh, of course, in London too. So he's going to tell us about his thoughts on tyres. Hi, um, my name's Ian Simpson. I'm a co-founding partner in Simpson Huff. I'm going to be less than five minutes, you'll be glad to know, which was what our brief was. Um, <laughs> cities are the drivers of our economic development. We in London have a growing city population. And one option for su a sustainable urban future is to build upwards. London, I believe, will benefit from the 500 or so tall buildings that are currently planned, as 90% of these are for residential. And they will provide in excess, as Peter said, of 100,000 new homes. It's just a pity that there aren't 1,500 tall buildings being proposed, as that actually might really help with London's, London's need for 66,000 new homes a year, bearing in mind how long it takes to get planning for um, a tall building. However, numbers aside, tall buildings impact on a city's skyline, um, and it is essential that they contribute positively. Design quality is fundamental to that perception. Good design, in my view, um, starts with a form derived from a response to program, context, and place. It is important to achieve as elegant a profile as possible. A beautiful building that reflects and refracts the sky and the streets, constantly changing in response to light, time, and season. The materiality in the facade should reinforce what is often a singular form, and in my mind, absorb the expression of the individual home and create a whole greater than the sum of its parts. I'm not advocating tall buildings at the expense of traditional streets, mid-rise buildings, and the city grain. I love all those aspects and include them in our work. I just see tall buildings as complementary one of a number of typologies for consideration to try and meet the housing needs of the capital. When a tall building is proposed, it should touch the ground lightly, maximizing the opportunity for public realm and creating a real sense of place. The top of the building is often the culmination of that singular form. What happens between should be inspiring and not just formulaic. The building envelope and its materiality should heighten the quality of life and experience for the residents, flooding their homes with natural light, providing views and aspect. 
This has been our ambition with One Blackfriars, a residential tower, hotel, and public space located on the southern bridgehead of Blackfriars Bridge. People do enjoy living in tall buildings. I live at the top of a tall building, and it is light, secure, and with an ever-changing prospect. It's a sanctuary and an oasis. It's safe, and it's a, in, the, in, the, in a busy, buzzing metropolitan centre, such as uh, one of our urban centres, London or Manchester. In London, however, we do have the opportunity to explore architectural language and material choice. As sales values are able to sustain real investment in our buildings and our public spaces. Unfortunately, however, more often than not, the political, the planning, the develop development process results in mediocre architectural responses. And inevitably, the refuge for such compromise solutions is generally the cluster, the collective grouping of often quite similar, polite, modernist neighbours around transport nodes or gateways. It's easy, so that's obviously supported by many London boroughs as a solution for dealing with tall buildings. However, I believe well-designed singular tall buildings have, have the opportunity to reinforce a city skyline and be a beautiful addition. All too often, however, that opportunity is missed. High-quality, mixed-use, super-tall buildings could really offer a, a fantastic social socially sustainable future. In, in effective interaction can occur where those buildings' uses interface, such as restaurants, bars, viewing galleries, parks, retail, all embedded in what some people might call a vertical street. You do need a building of about 500 to 600 metres high to achieve that. Um, and that's the problem in London. Actually, it's a real challenge. The tallest building we have in this city is the Shard. Everything else is averaging at 29 storeys. It's a compromise, and I think we need to be bold because in 100 years' time, we'll just look back and wonder what the hell the fuss was about. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ian. And now our last speaker is Barbara Weiss. She's co-founder of the Skyline Campaign. Uh, which she founded about the same time as our first survey into tall buildings. So uh, uh, I look forward to hearing what you have to say about the latest research. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, good morning. Um, uh, the, the question we were asked is, are towers responding to the right needs of a growing city? And my answer is clearly no. Um, I, I think in particular I'm, I'm going to be addressing towers in London. And um, my belief is that every city has its own DNA. So while there are cities around the world where towers can uh, exist very, in a very positive way, uh, London's DNA is completely different. Um, so uh, here I have a slide of rabbits in Australia. Uh, towers, in actual fact, are, are a non-indigenous uh, species in, in London. And um, uh, this is what happened to Australia, and we're beginning to go that way with 500 towers. So what is London's DNA? In my mind, it's much more like this, uh, which are beautiful streets and squares and places we love, and where our memories uh, are attached to a, a particular identity. London has its own uh, particular identity, and anybody seeing these slides would know immediately where they are in the world. So why do we find uh, towers a problem? Uh, there are lots of reasons, uh, and there are lots of threats. So uh, in particular, the threat to our heritage assets. And there are far too many examples of this kind of, uh, of, of slide um, um, where uh, architects and planners didn't foresee the, the consequences of allowing a tall building. Uh, here's another one with the shard sprouting out of a uh, 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 the Tower of London. Um, other problems is uh, overdevelopment. Uh, this is a building that most people knew, that they sort of were aware of it, uh, but looking at it, you can see how proud and elegant and minimalist the shape of the Shell Tower 
um, um, was uh, sit sitting right next to the uh, South Bank and uh, a, a very nice composition, horizontal and vertical. And this is what it's become now. Uh, it's a real tragedy, I think. Uh, it's being swamped and buried in very mediocre residential towers. Um, this is another uh, threat is, uh, which has been mentioned by several speakers, which is very poor quality architecture. Uh, towers that have been built cheaply, and badly designed, and have a really negative effect uh, on, on, uh, on streets, which can be seen from absolutely everywhere. And this is another uh, example of something wrong. It's obviously a building in the wrong location. There are far too many uh, examples of this happening. We have a nice residential street where people can enjoy coming home to their little houses in the center of London. It still has that sort of slightly villagey feeling until you get a building like this at the end of it. Um, and here um, is a cluster. I'm also totally against clusters. And it just shows how every building is different. We're getting now uh, an asparagus patch. Uh, there's been a whole um, decade of iconic shapes. Uh, everybody's emperor's new clothes. Everybody's trying to do something different. These buildings have no order in the city. They're not considering the city as a whole. Um, they're some taller, some lower, different materials, on the whole materials that are not indigenous to London. Um, so here's a cluster. Uh, the city uh, of London, which is becoming more and more congested. Again, I see absolutely no beauty in this. Uh, we were shown at uh, the NLA launch the other day um, uh, the views from the office of somebody in the cheese grater, which are going to be uh, very soon completely um, obliterated by the next building that's going to be built in front of it. So what is the value of uh, building so densely, so tall, and um, sort of co co constantly canceling out the next building's um, uh, um, best aspects. So uh, the great danger of all of this is that we are now creating what I call generic city. Generic city is a city where you can't tell where you are. So these are four, um, four slides from around the world, and you would hardly know where you are if it weren't for some little clue. So the first uh, slide is Paris, La Défense. You can see the Arc de Triomphe in the distance. The second one is um, at the top is uh, Sydney. Uh, I was there quite recently, and I actually felt physically ill. Um, it, it is um, completely overcrowded with uh, every possible kind of, of shape and form, materials, uh, the place is just vulgar. You know, there's no other way of describing it. Uh, the, the lowest, one of the lowest uh, slides is of Tokyo, uh, very bland and boring. And finally, we get uh, the view that I have to look at every day um, from my office, and that's uh, the Albert Embankment that's becoming more and more um, taken over by very uh, mediocre towers that look as if they've been sitting in somebody's drawer for years and were just pulled out um, because nobody could be bothered to think what to do better. So um, I must have been one of the few people in the room last week to think that the news of 50 more towers was actually good news for me and not so such good news for the rest of the people in the room. I do feel that uh, the tide has turned. Um, and uh, these uh, um, points below um, are uh, some of the headwinds that tower buildings, uh, building is facing. Um, uncertainty, people are realizing that construction costs are going through the roof, um, particularly the market. There's a, a glut of unsold luxury flats, and I'm delighted that Pocket Living are, uh, are building uh, flats, affordable flats for key workers. That's great. It's a good model. Um, but the majority of flats are not contributing to the housing crisis. It's a very simplistic uh, and dishonest way of uh, portraying what these towers are doing. Uh, the, the mayor, Sadiq Khan, who started out very well, is falling into the same trap as Boris Johnson. Uh, it's a numbers game. It's become a numbers game, but it doesn't in any way reflect the reality of the housing crisis. 
Uh, people are also realizing that towers take longer to build. Um, uh, the mayor is asking for more and more affordable housing, quite rightly. Um, uh, the boroughs are also waking up to the fact that um, uh, they don't really want uh, a lot of these really ugly buildings, uh, badly designed and badly positioned. And then there's, I'm glad to say, quite a lot of resident opposition. So um, future problems, um, this slide is a bit exaggerated, but uh, towers will need a lot of maintenance. And maintenance, as, um, uh, as we were hearing earlier, is very expensive. And most people who buy these little flats are not aware of the fact that very soon they're going to have to be forking out huge amounts of money because the cladding will need redoing, the lifts will need redoing, because um, there are all kinds of reasons why towers are going to end up costing a fortune. And so they could well be abandoned, and we could be, end up with a lot of slums, uh, which are very tall. So finally, there was a question uh, to me, do other cities build design plan uh, better for tall buildings? I'm um, half American. I've lived in New York for five years. I love New York. Um, I think New York is a fantastic city of towers, and they've done it way better than any other city. Um, and in this slide, you can see two magnificent um, masonry, solid, well-designed buildings. But obviously, New York has also got its problems now with its planning system. And I would say that the interloper between the two beautiful towers is a real pity and should never have been allowed. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, Barbara. Uh, now we've got time for um, discussion and uh, uh, questions from the floor. So if our speakers would like to come up to uh, the panel and uh, uh, those people who have a question, perhaps they could uh, uh, raise their hand so I can see them and we'll get a microphone to them um, as soon as possible. Right, well, we'll start over there and work across the room. Uh, gentleman there at the back. Um, hello, Andrew Wood from the Isle of Dogs. So this morning, people were having to wait for between, ten, for between two and ten minutes for the hot water to arrive when they switch their showers on. So they put the, you know, the shower on and walk away and then come back and check and then come back. So how do you think we can resolve this issue? We can't even supply hot water and tall towers. What are we doing? Right. <laughs> that's a tricky one. Who, yeah, I, I think that's um, Jonathan or, or Ian as to uh, how, how, how does the hot water work in your towers? <laughs> Mine worked just okay this morning, actually. I don't know how to respond to that question. I guess but that's what the service charges are for. But, but, the, but the more important point, I, I can't answer that question clearly, that we're creating much more complex, more expensive to run buildings, which when they stop working, if the, if, the, if, the, if the money isn't cascading through the building to pay for much more expensive hydraulics and water, if it isn't cascading through the building, and that's, that's easy to do in luxury towers in the middle of Manchester and the middle of London, fine, that's, that's their place. Um, but when we're talking about affordable housing or just normal housing, it is almost impossible to say we can guarantee there'll be enough money flooding through that system 10, 20, 30, 100 years hence. And that, though it's a micro point, but it's not a micro point if it's your shower isn't working, that goes to the absolute nub of the problem. Sorry, yeah. that wasn't what you wanted me to say. Uh, no, but I, I just pick up an issue also which Barbara mentioned at the end, uh, which is about maintenance, and there has been some stories about maintenance of people replacing cladding post Grenfell and so on. So, um, Ian and Jonathan, um, is, is that an issue? In, I mean, that's a matter of good design. Of course, yes. your, your buildings are all good, well designed and wouldn't have those sorts of issues. But, uh, Thank you. Um, certainly, access to maintenance is a, you know, a consideration. We believe it's integrated effectively on both of our buildings. <coughs> to answer the gentleman's question, um, Mapleton Crescent is 20 floor, 27 floors high. Um, we have um, very simple risers through the building. It, it also happens to be the tallest off-site steel-framed modular tower in Europe, um, which you know, is really, really simple. Um, it works very well. Plenty of hot water, I think, hopefully. I, I just think it's a nonsense to think that... Uh, terraced housing doesn't have its own maintenance issues with the roof and the gutters. And the, I mean, the simple fact is, every time you plug into a drain, 
with a tower, you've got maybe 200 apartments actually doing that in one position on one site. A, a, a suburbia exte extends massively over um, a wide area. So I, I don't think you can... I mean, we, we know what statistics mean. I, I mean, it, it, I just think it's an absolute nonsense in terms of trying to pretend that everything bad is associated with tall buildings. They have their problems just as someone living in a Georgian mansion or Kensington or wherever they might live have uh, issues to do with maintenance. It's just part of living in life. Uh, so so I, 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 I think it's interesting that Ian also mentioned, and everybody talks about towers is now mentioning it, that the majority are very poor quality and badly designed, and they've been allowed to um, to be built by previous mayor, and I think they're going to be built for quite a number of years. So we are having really uh, this onslaught of bad buildings which are hugely visible. And I think they're being sold to people as these luxury flats. They were really being built to flog. Uh, I spent this weekend walking around Nine Elms. It's really depressing uh, to see you know, very cheap materials. I think people are just being conned. Um, and uh, that should stop. I, I didn't have a slide today of what should be done to stop this. But certainly, uh, we need a huge extra scrutiny before these buildings are allowed and go to go through planning and to go through the next stages. I think they have to be. Thanks. We have a question here. Uh, Peter Everston, London Forum of Community and Civic Societies. Um, the alternative to the tall buildings are, are the magnificent um, terraces uh, and uh, block, mansion blocks that we have in central West London. But they were built when we had all the land to do exactly what we wanted with. How do we assemble land enough to do more of that when what the developers are doing is just obtaining a postage stamp piece of land and maximizing the profit on it? Right. So. Who's going to start with that one? Oh, I think you want another question. I can no, no, thank you. Yeah. take that. Sorry. I mean, I think there are several, several sort of layers of answer to that very, very important question. Um, I didn't get to this, but we do have a very strange planning system in historic and comparative terms. So, you know, you say we, we, we built West London when we had all the land in the, in the world. Actually, the reason we built West London was because the planning system changed. We just didn't call it that at the time. So, uh, under the Elizabethan system and then early Jacobeans, uh, you weren't allowed to build beyond a mile of, uh, of the city of London without paying a huge fine. They then flipped that round post the Great Fire in 1667, changed the way of pla you know, planning, as we now call it, building regs, and allowed you to build as long as you built a certain set format. And they, they regulated what you could build, and then off you could go. Um, so we need ultimately to get back to a system where we pre-approve certain types of densification and turn you know, large swathes of London. And then I'm a, I'm a fan of green fingers rather than green belts. Uh, following some of the transit out of London, allow beautiful, dense, walkable, medium rise, or low to medium rise, with a bit of high rise, because there is a place for it, I absolutely agree. To, to, to extend out. So that ultimately is the answer. Under the, under the current system, and this is why actually I don't blame in, at one level the developers or the architects who, who are building these monstrosities, um, lovely monstrosities in some cases, because they're, they're responding to the, to the stimuli they're given. Um, but un, under, the, under the current system, I think the, the, the best hope in the short to the medium term is, is to uh, e extend in a populist way permitted development so that uh, existing streets can be, can, be up, can be uplifted with density. Which is, but it is a hard thing to do under the current system. I, I'd absolutely so I, I could ask Jonathan as well, because I mean, your site is, um, uh, makes fantastic use of that land, wasn't it? Half, uh, half a hectare or something, and you've managed to fit... Uh, it's it's uh, tiny. It's a postage stamp. Uh, you wouldn't expect to put a building on it, let alone a 27-floor building. Um, Land, there's no answer to the problem of land. You know, land is what makes housing so expensive in this capital. Um, I can't you know, begin to answer, you know, offer a response. Um, it's, it's a real problem. And it's why we have to look at you know, perhaps the green belts. Um, do we really want taller buildings you know, surrounding London as well? You know, it's a real debate. So I you know, can't really offer a, an We've nationalised planning. We've nationalised planning in this country, and most countries regulate it. And once we realise what a strange planning system we have, and we start to unlock that crucial question. But it, it's not going to be a, you know, over, overnight thing. Okay, uh, question here. Yeah. Um, Stuart Bailey, J.L. Heron Planning Consultants. We contributed to the NLA's um, recent report. Um, 
I um, have a question slightly similar to the last question, so um, apologies if that's a bit of overlap, but um, I probably agree with about 70% of all that the speakers have said. Um, I'm not going to portion the 70% <laughs> amount to guess from my, my question. Um, it's, really, it's really these points about um, it, land values in London and, and how do we meet the housing challenges in London. Um, 66,000 homes per annum required. The green belt's not going anywhere as far as I can see it. Um, how do, we, how do we address that? Uh, tall buildings aren't the only answer to that, part of the answer, but also about cities evolving as well. So London can't stand still. Um, so that's the question. So I think the answer is outer London, uh, not the green belt. Uh, everybody forgets that there is such a thing as outer London. Outer London is huge and very, very, of very low density, and house, most of it has a really poor housing stock. Uh, and they have our practices for beginning to design uh, taller uh, typologies, you know, four or five stories. And I'm sure one could uh, design a whole new type of outer London that is better suited to current demographics, that still has the quality of outer London, particularly along, uh, we were pushing along the main arteries, so it, along the A roads, for instance we worked out you could get thousands and thousands of units if those building, if, if, if there were consistent buildings along those. So I think we should stop building in central London. Central London is as tall as it can get, uh, and we should start looking at outer London before we look at the Green Belt. Another point? No? Oh wait, question again. Uh, Michael Bach, London Forum also. We're having enough difficulty selling high density and the public uh, reacting to that. Do you think they really buy high rise? So who was that aimed at? Anybody else? Right, Ian. Uh, I think he was looking at you. <laughs> I think if you ask anybody the question of where they would like to live, I think the notion of a, a Kensington Square or a Georgian Square would be certainly top of the list. It is. Um, it is, yeah. Um, but we don't, we're not building Georgian squares anymore. Um, we that ended, that. Well, That's a simple we, answer. We should. I mean, we should. don't live in a Georgian period. I, I, I just, I, it, that <coughs> devalues in my mind. I mean, it, it completely devalues the whole notion of what the quality architecture and Georgian squares are all about. If you think you can replicate it out in, in the suburbs somewhere. Um, Maybe, but yeah. but but when they so I have to when they built the Georgian squares, they were the suburbs. When they extended West London, they were building in the green fields. And they built they them were as extending London with they a built density them as high and a fixed urban form that we're now no, too scared to they do. They built them as as dense and as high as they physically could do because they didn't have lifts. So at the end of the day, we, that typology has changed. So we do have more opportunity for scale and height. You should read the 1778 legislation and what they built. Well, I'd the rather reason, leave that the to you, you go, Well, the reason, uh, the reason they built to the height they did for the, built for the streets and the squares they did was because they were told what they could build. It was set right. by right. Sorry. Uh, okay. Let's We've get back got to the lots, questions. lots of What's other questions, questions to... to I, I, th I think well, Nick, to be Nick, honest, to be honest, if, if if people didn't buy and want to live in tall buildings, people wouldn't build them. Well, there's, there's right. there's people there's live, some live people do like them. We did some research people right, do, right at the beginning. Do, Actually, uh, I think 27% of people did like the idea every of living time in I, Every time buildings. I get into my building that I live in, the residents say, we really love living here. Yeah. And that's not because I'm the architect of the building. <laughs> I'm sure it's got <laughs> something to do with it. But, uh, yeah, we've got a question at the back there. <laughs> Uh, yes, hello. Uh, Nick Blake from Slice Architects. Uh, tall buildings may have a good place in central London, but further out, a lot of times working with developers, we find because of the land costs uh, and to get the value out of the site and make it work, uh, they can't build it at eight storeys because of regulations, and we're forced to go higher. And the regulations are rights of light, sunlight, and daylight. If you look at the mansion blocks that are built in West London, pre-Second World War, they wouldn't get through the regulations now. We need to look at them again. Right. So, uh, Nick, do you think we should uh, look I at regulation and uh, uh, guidance? Cr crucially important point, and I, I, I ran slightly over time, so I didn't quite get to that one, but um, and this is, uh, this goes absolutely to the heart of it, which is uh, unintentionally, because if you look at the strategic statements in the last London plan, or in the current one, uh, or in the, some of the previous SPGs, they're very clear that they were in favour, actually, of mid-rise with towers having their place. 
So then when you look at the detail of, and I'm sorry we have, uh, you know, the BRE guidance of quite a lot of the uh, level two guidance that the London plan has not gone to, it essentially unintentionally bans uh, gentle density, medium rise, finely grained. Um, you know, I, I, was in, I, was, I was in Venice just 10 days ago. I don't think I, apart, possibly from St. Mark's Square, I don't think I was in a single urban space that would meet modern requirements. It is ridiculous to be banning the type of property and the type of urban form that people provably prefer. It's okay. insane. Now, a bit about, uh, one thing you mentioned about the problem with concierges in tall buildings, needing them. I was in Milan last week, and that uh, six-storey building had a concierge. Almost every six-storey building in Paris has a concierge as well. Sure. I've lived so in Paris. I'm not sure the most do in Paris. I've lived in Paris. Milan, I'll, I'll, defer, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the point on Milan. Right, there's a question over there. Uh, hi, uh, Tom Hawkins here from In Media. I feel like I should ask a question on behalf of the much maligned millennial generation. Um, if tall buildings have one purpose, it's surely to help us all get onto the housing ladder. Um, and millennials, unlike what Mr. Schumacher said yesterday, would quite like living rooms, probably would like to live in Georgian homes, but I see tall buildings as having their place in helping that. Um, so my question is, why are we seeing so many tall buildings that don't help get millennials on the housing ladder? How does one Blackfriars, how does Nine Elms help solve the housing crisis? I th yeah. I think that it's... it's um there's an opportunity when you're um, maximize, optimizing is the word, the density on a particular site, and it can create a certain number of units. I mean, one Blackfriars has created a lot of um, affordable homes, not in the building, but within the borough, and a large sum of money has been generated to pay for that. If that building was simply <coughs> much, much smaller, then the receipt to create more affordable homes would be much lower. That's a fair point. And it's, the, the simple issue is, is that in London, it's extremely expensive. I've got a 23-year-old daughter trying to find a home here. Impossible. You do have to move out to the suburbs, you know, a long way. And nobody can really afford to live in central London. And I, and I think that's the issue, is, is that um, it doesn't matter how dense you are, uh, how dense you're creating, how, how beautiful you create a Georgian home. They're five million pounds for a house. I mean, it, it, let's, let's get real about the values in, in central London. It's unaffordable. And I think we should be optimising every single plot of land to try and generate as many houses and homes of whatever size and scale as we possibly can, because when demand is met, prices come down. It's as simple as that. Great. We had... Uh, Here. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Over there. Chris Roach, 1104 Architects. My question is for Jonathan uh, in particular, but it's open to anybody uh, First of all, I should declare that I, I'm a fan of tall buildings. I think in the right set of circumstances, they're ideal. And particularly if they're well designed, which was one of Jonathan's points, the three tenets of good high-rise buildings is design quality. The fundamental issue, though, that seems to be missing from this debate is post-Grenfell, what constitutes good design? A fundamental part of that is public safety. And the high-rise building in Croydon seem to have a single staircase, which is currently being considered as being inappropriate for high-rise buildings. Now, I presume the building in question has got a sprinkled staircase and sprinkled lobbies and adequate fire protection, but given that those technological issues may have been thoroughly thoroughly resolved. The first question which seemed somewhat inane in the context of this debate about the failure of water to rise 20 storeys isn't just an issue for showers and hot water. Technical failure is something that we have to accept. And if you can't get water to supply those sprinklers because of some bizarre set of circumstances, then people are trapped and single staircases are not the way. So it's a complex question. I don't expect a sophisticated answer, but a brief answer about how you've addressed that particular in instant post grant Right, Ian Jonathan, do you want to respond to those? Yeah. Okay, um, well, both of my buildings do have single staircases. Um, we spent a long time uh, with the London Fire Brigade. The London Fire Brigade are entirely happy uh, they helped us develop the proposals. 
if we were to have a second core on most skin in Croydon, that would result in fewer um, homes. Um, there's a 30 meter long corridor. It's, it's right on the limit, um, but it does have all the necessary requirements, sprinklers, you know, smoke shafts, um, wide corridors. Um, it meets all the requirements you know, uh, of this current age. Uh, and I don't, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, you know it's a very valid point. Um, there's a wet riser, so you know, my client has to maintain that. Um, luckily, you know, the service charges on Mapleton are proposed at about 900 pounds a year which is you know, reasonable in my opinion. Um, servicing tall buildings, maintaining tall buildings, you know, it's a real, you know, real problem. Um, but it has to, you know, it, it's one that I address. Right, we have, uh, one question there and last question here. So, uh, yeah, thanks. thanks very much. Uh, Danny Kay, Sheridan Development Management. I think um, just listening to all of this, Nicholas and Barbara make a very compelling case. But putting aside... Um, behavioral and psychological evidence, putting aside long-term maintenance, service charge costs for taller buildings and so on, putting aside exacerbating uh, problems to do with unbalanced and unmixed communities and mixed tenures, putting all that aside, um, just let's look at the, let's just look at the, um, the values. To make a tall building work from a financial viability perspective, you really are looking at a minimum in the current market, and the current market is dropping, arguably, in London, a minimum of 800, 850 pounds a square foot. That equates to between a one bed and a two bed of 450,000 pounds to 600, 625,000 pounds as an average. That's a minimum. Most taller buildings in the top locations are at much higher values. That is not going to solve the London housing crisis. Very interesting point, thank you. Uh, right, <coughs> one last question here, and then uh, the, uh, the panel can pick up on that. So my here. name is Iona Strelitz, and I led the consultation with Londoners over then LPAC's last uh, attempt to deal with this issue before uh, the GLA was formed. And there were then, uh, there was a very different landscape. There were very few and much more distributed tall buildings that we did our consultation around. And we found from that study that people who were living in tall buildings liked living there and that people who looked at tall buildings liked looking at them. But we now have a very different scenario with many more extremes of building form. And so my question is to Ian. Um, how do you uh, justify the argument that people like living in tall buildings against an equivalent argument that people who uh, airlift their Lamborghinis into Kensington in the, for the summer season like racing them along Knightsbridge? You know, simply because the minority who like doing things that they can afford to do isn't an adequate argument for the community who live in a city to uh, endorse those preferences? Yeah. Obviously, I'm, I'm <coughs> privileged to be working in other cities that don't have those sorts of sales values or construction values in which we're building thousands of homes in tall buildings because it's the effective way of uh, creating a high-density uh, city core. And that is a lot to do with, with uh, value of land. And the people who choose to live in those homes are not wealthy people. You know, you can buy an apartment for less than £200,000. Find me one in London and I'll have it off you because there isn't one. And um, you, the, all the, every other city outside the capital is struggling in terms of uh, investment, in terms of um, jobs, and they are there <laughs> looking to embrace change so if London's got a housing problem, then why don't we try and just cast the net a little bit further far, far and ensure that jobs and departments of industry and all those other things are actually located out of this city centre so that other cities can benefit and the millions and millions of people that live out there and the homes that they can live in are all affordable because London doesn't care really about its population it's on a downward trend at the moment in terms of its perception inside the city. It has this 
uh, on we approach to uh, life, we are London, we are, we are successful, and we've lived in that time, and now it's changing, and nobody can live in the city centre again. But people do enjoy living in tall buildings, and I'm not saying people wouldn't enjoy living in a, in a, a house in Kensington, which they would, as, as would anybody at Georgian Terrace. I was in one yesterday, not mine, I might add. But I, I do think that we need to spread the net wider. And you talk about the suburbs. I mean, when the HS2 comes, Birmingham will be 45 minutes away. So I think we need to think more proactively about trying to worrying about density in the capital. And actually, now that the values are starting to fall and values are starting to rise in other cities, you know, they're, they're starting to get a bit more of an equilibrium about it. But it's still much more affordable anywhere else other than the centre of London. Thank you very much. So a good point to en end on. So move to the northern powerhouse and uh, you'll be able to find uh, your affordable homes. But uh, yes, I think you will. Many, many people in this room would, would think that at least we need a regional plan to sort out some of those issues that George met, if not Absolutely a national a plan. plan. But uh, we have a government that doesn't really believe in planning these days. So uh, <laughs> anyway, um, uh, a, 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 a fascinating debate. And I think one of the really interesting things about it was that when we first launched our study, the thing was that it was such a... A surprise that there were as many towers in the pipeline as there were. And then it was only 263. And Boris Johnson had said all this new housing uh, doesn't mean we're going to see towers popping up everywhere. And it does mean that. And one of the things that we're doing, we're working with uh, View City to uh, uh, deliver a comprehensive uh, uh, three-dimensional computer model of London, which we hope the mayor is going to use to help with planning. And also communities can see to see actually what the impact of uh, tall buildings and new uh, development is on particular areas. So we can actually have a, a, a debate, uh, early debate, about uh, uh, what sort of city uh, we have in the future, because it was a real surprise, not only to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, local communities, but actually to uh, the mayor himself. So uh, uh, thank you very much for coming to this. Uh, really important to debate these issues in the way we have. So thank you very much for coming, and thank you all for being here. <laughs>